Welcome to Washington Hospital Today, the program dedicated to sharing timely information about the community hospital that's been taking care of Washington Township Healthcare District residents since it opened in 1958. Washington Hospital Today is provided for the sole purpose of informing residents about healthcare topics and issues that have been covered during community forums, free health and wellness classes, or as part of educational sessions held during the district's open board meetings. This program is one more way that Washington Hospital helps empower you, the residents of the district, by providing information needed to make informed decisions about your health. Today's presenter is Andrea Walters. Andrea has been a registered nurse at Washington Hospital for nine years. She graduated from Cal State University Hayward with a Bachelor's of Science in Nursing. Andrea was raised in Fremont and is happy to be able to serve the community in which she grew up in. My objectives for tonight, we're gonna to talk about the myths surrounding insulin. I'm gonna talk about two different types of diabetes, type one and type two. I'm going to talk about how insulin affects the body and the different types of insulin and the effects of insulin on blood sugar. Okay, the first myth is insulin is forever or diabetics always need insulin. And this isn't always the case. People who will have type 1 diabetes, they definitely do need to be on insulin because their pancreas just does not produce any insulin for them. Type 2 diabetics, they may or may not need insulin. Uh, about 13% of the type 2 diabetics, they need insulin and oral medication. 14% use insulin alone. 57% use oral medication alone. And then the lucky 16% just get to use the diet and exercise. But again, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be forever. I do see patients come in who are newly diagnosed diabetic and they are put on insulin for a short period of time just to help regulate their blood sugar and then eventually they are transitioned to oral medication. The second myth, complications from diabetes are caused by insulin. Again, the complications from diabetes arise when your blood sugar is not controlled. So for example, you may have a high blood sugar for a prolonged period of time. This can cause damage to your eyes, it can cause damage to your nerves, it can cause damage to certain organs in your body, like your kidneys. I do see patients come in with complications from diabetes. We do see people, you know, with a lot of foot wounds. When you can't, when you have nerve damage, you can't necessarily always feel your feet, and you may walk around barefoot in your house or outside. You can sustain some type of injury to the bottom of your foot and never know it's there until one day you took, take a look at the bottom of your foot and you notice you have some type of wound that unfortunately you won't be able to treat at home. You'll have to come into the hospital and we'll have to provide you some antibiotics and sometimes surgery if necessary. So again, complications from diabetes, it, it does not arise from insulin usage. It arises from no, no insulin usage or no oral medication usage. The third myth, taking insulin means you failed. This, this, this isn't, that's not the truth. And it goes back to what you said earlier about you, know, you feeling like your grandma. Diabetes is a progressive disease, which means you know, over time, the beta cells in your pancreas, those are the cells that produce the insulin, you know, they kind of just die out on you, unfortunately. You can eat right, you can exercise your 30 minutes every day, you know, you can take your medications as prescribed, but unfortunately that just may not be enough for you and you might have to start on insulin. But in no means does it mean that you failed. Uh, the fourth myth, insulin injections hurt. This, is, this can and cannot happen. Nowadays needles are made very short and very fine, almost if you think about a piece of hair, sometimes the needles are actually that thin. Depending on where you inject it, you may have a little bit of pain, but we'll go over that in a couple more slides. But nowadays, insulin needles are made for comfort. And the final myth, insulin is difficult to use. Nowadays, it's more simple than ever. 
insulin does come in vials. They no longer necessarily have to be refrigerated. If you have a closed vial, it should be put in the refrigerator, not the freezer, but the refrigerator. If you have an open vial of insulin, you can keep it on your counter for roughly a month, as long as it's room temperature and you wanna keep it out of direct sunlight. But again, insulin is just more easy to use. They also have insulin in injectable pen form now, which is nice because it's kind of like one-stop shopping. You know, you just dial up how many units you need to give yourself and you can just, you know, give it to yourself in your preferred site, whether it's your abdomen or your arm, etc. The needles are shorter and finer and it's all about comfort. I have a little piece of artwork there. It shows a nurse with this very large needle. I think when people are first told that, you know, they're gonna have to start using insulin, this could be potentially what you think of. You think of a really big needle that you're gonna have to stab into yourself every day. But like I said, again, that's not the case anymore. Needles are very, very small. Common injection sites. You have four common injection sites here. There's the area around your abdomen. You wanna kinda inject it into that fatty tissue on your abdomen. Be aware not to give it too close to your belly button because you do have a lot of nerves there and it could hurt if you inject it too close to your belly button. Other areas that you can inject into are that fatty tissue on the back side of your arm, the outer side of your thigh. Please be careful, do not give your injection on the inner part of your thigh. And I only say this because, you know, your pants rub along the inner part of your thigh when you walk, you could somehow get some injection site irritation. So you want to stay to the outer parts of your thigh and the final injection site that you can give yourself insulin into is your buttocks. Keep in mind absorption rates differ for each site. It absorbs fastest in the abdomen, second fastest in the back of the arm, third fastest in the thigh, and the slowest area of absorption is in the buttocks. Now we're gonna talk about two different types of diabetes. Type one diabetes, this is when the body does not produce enough insulin. Uh, it usually is diagnosed in children and young adults. This type of diabetes accounts for five to 10 percent of all diabetics. Most diabetics have type two diabetes. This is where your body does not use insulin properly or does not produce enough insulin. This accounts for about 90 to 95 percent of diabetics, and it's usually diagnosed in adulthood. Okay, I have a movie here. When you eat, your body breaks down food into sugar or glucose. Glucose is used as a source of energy by your body. Glucose travels through the bloodstream to reach all the cells in your body. When you eat, your pancreas releases insulin. Insulin takes the glucose from the blood into your body's cells to be used for energy. This energy supports all of the things your body needs to do to stay alive. In type 1 diabetes, the body does not make insulin. Type 1 diabetes accounts for 5 to 10 percent of all cases of diabetes. It is usually diagnosed in children and young adults and lasts for the person's whole life. People with type 1 diabetes take insulin daily. To stay healthy, they need to keep their blood glucose in a target range by balancing insulin with a meal plan and exercise. Type 2 diabetes accounts for 90 to 95 percent of all cases of diabetes and most often occurs in adults. People with type 2 diabetes manage their diabetes by using a meal plan, being active, and taking diabetes medicines, including insulin, if needed. Working with their health care team, all people with diabetes can develop a treatment plan that works for them. When people have diabetes, their body does not make enough insulin, or the insulin it does make does not work well. 
Without insulin, your body can't use food properly. That is, glucose cannot enter your cells and be used for energy. As a result, glucose builds up in the blood. Often the pancreas makes some insulin, but the body cannot use it well. This is called insulin resistance. If your body cannot use insulin, glucose cannot enter your cells and be used for energy. Again, glucose builds up in your blood. To help the glucose enter the cells, the pancreas tries to make more insulin. For some reason, as if the pancreas gets tired, insulin production eventually slows down. Most people with type 2 diabetes have insulin resistance and defective insulin secretion. That is, their body cannot properly use the insulin it makes, and their body does not make enough insulin. Okay, so just to recap, for those who have type 2 diabetes, the pancreas does not make enough insulin or doesn't utilize the insulin properly. So when, you're, when you eat your food, the body isn't absorbing the sugar from the food. The sugar remains in the blood, and this causes an elevated blood sugar. The next topic is low blood sugar or hypoglycemia. This is abnormally low blood glucose. Signs and symptoms from this are shakiness, nervousness, anxiety, sweating, chills, clamminess, irritability, confusion, dizziness, lightheadedness, hunger, nausea, blurred or impaired vision, headache, weakness, or fatigue. You, while you're in the hospital, any patient who has a blood sugar of 69 or less, we will treat that low blood sugar. And I'll go into the treatment on the next slide. Sometimes your blood sugar could be dropping slowly, and some people never even notice that their blood sugar is low. Other people can definitely feel the symptoms. You know, they start to feel real shaky, they start to sweat. That's not uncommon. The seizures and unconsciousness. This will happen if your blood sugar gets really, really low. And I'm talking like 20 or 30. So that's just something to keep in mind. There is something called nocturnal hypoglycemia. And this is just when you start to develop low blood sugar at night. You know, when you're sleeping, you usually, you know, you may not feel this because you're sleeping right through it. So to prevent this from happening, it's important to monitor your sugar at bedtime. I always tell my patients, you know, check your blood sugar before each meal and at bedtime, and to make sure that you eat an appropriate snack right before bed. You know, not just like a piece of candy, but you know, maybe half an apple with some peanut butter or some cheese and crackers, something like that, that will sustain the blood sugar throughout the night. The treatment of low blood sugar, we follow the rule of 15. So you wanna consume 15 grams of glucose or simple carbohydrates, uh, such as three to four glucose tablets, you know, a tube of glucose gel, half a cup of juice, two tablespoons of raisins, a tablespoon of sugar, honey, or corn syrup, one cup of non-fat or 1% milk, or five to six hard candies. Now these are just a bunch of examples. Please don't eat all of those at once if you're a hypoglycemic because then we're gonna be dealing with the other side of this, which is hyperglycemia. So remember, just one of these examples. Once you consume your 15 grams, wait 15 minutes and recheck your blood sugar. If your hypoglycemia continues, then go ahead and repeat this whole process. Consume another 15 grams, wait 15 minutes to recheck your sugar, Hopefully your hypoglycemia will be resolved by then. If it's not, I would say it's time to get some emergency help. Call 911, call a friend or family member taking you to the emergency room. Whatever you do, please don't drive because if your blood sugar, you know, if you're hypoglycemic, you don't want to pass out while you're driving. If, if there are people who have chronically high blood sugar, you know, they start to get used to that high number. So once you're, if your blood sugar drops and comes into a more normal level, that will feel very different for you. So you can actually experience, you know, like the clamminess or the shaking. That's not uncommon. Yeah, I do see that in patients. I have patients say, you know, Andrea, I, I don't feel right. Can you check my sugar? And I check their sugar and it's completely normal. But they've been high for so long 
that being in that normal range just feels really, really strange to them. This is an abnormally high blood sugar. The signs and symptoms of this is high blood glucose, high levels of sugar in the urine, frequent urination or increased thirst. There are a lot of different causes for high blood sugar, some of which are you may have eaten more than expected throughout the day. You know, we recommend 30 minutes of exercise every day. You may have exercised maybe not at all or maybe only for 10 minutes. That can contribute to a higher blood sugar. Stress from illness, like a cold or a flu, can increase your sugar levels or any social stressors like um, maybe a death in the family, a death of a friend, any type of family conflict that can affect your blood sugar as well. Final thing that could affect your, your blood sugar are medications. High doses of aspirin can actually elevate your blood sugar. The sulfa medications, which are used to treat bacterial infections, you might see an elevation in that as well. And finally, corticosteroids like prednisone or solumedrol, that will definitely increase your blood sugar. I see a lot of patients come in with bronchitis and asthma exacerbations, and the doctor will put them on some type of corticosteroid like, like the prednisone or solumedrol, and we will see their blood sugar go up. But we were able to control it in the hospital because you will probably most likely be on insulin when you're in the hospital. So the treatment of high blood sugar. Exercise, it's very important. Um, I like to say 30 minutes a day, five days a week. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be 30 minutes all at once. You can eat breakfast, go for a 10 minute walk, eat lunch, go for a 10 minute walk, and eat dinner and go for a 10 minute walk, and you have your 30 minutes right there. Also, if you're newly diagnosed diabetic and you know, the doctor's telling you to exercise and you haven't exercised for a long period of time, don't think you can go out and just run a mile, okay? I don't want to see anyone having an asthma attack or something on the ground because they just decided to be a, an Olympic runner right after they were diagnosed. Other things um, that can change to help your high blood sugar are change in diet and medication. Before attempting to do this, definitely speak with your, with your doctor and your dietitian because they'll, they'll guide you on the right path. Um, before we get into the different types of insulin, I want to talk about the importance of checking your blood sugar. When, we're in the we're, when patients are in the hospital, we check their blood sugar at least before every meal and at bedtime. We also want to make sure that the insulin that you're being given it has not expired. So you want to check the expiration date on your insulin. Also make sure that your insulin looks right to you. If you're on a rapid acting or a short acting or a long acting insulin, you want to make sure that insulin is clear. It, for those taking intermediate acting insulins, those insulins are cloudy, so that is normal. But just you know, be aware of how your insulin should look. Now to go through the different types of insulin, I am going to talk about rapid acting insulin, short acting insulin, intermediate, long acting, and premixed insulin. The first one, rapid acting insulin. This is like the jet planes of all insulin. This is your Epidra, your Humalog, or your Novolog. Um, I should have some, uh, some pictures on there to show you um, what the different vials look like. This insulin also comes in an injectable pen form as well. It starts to work within 15 minutes of administration. It controls your blood sugar for roughly two to four hours. The one important thing to remember about rapid acting insulin is that it starts to work right away. So please do not forget to eat. For example, check your blood sugar, give yourself your insulin, and then eat your meal. Don't try to, you know, wait, you know, oh, I need to wait 15 minutes before I need to eat. You don't necessarily have to do that. In fact, if you even forget to give your insulin right before the meal, you, can ask, you could give it during your meal or even right after your meal. One other thing actually to mention about rapid acting, rapid acting insulin is how do you know if it's working for you? What we like to say is, your pre-meal blood sugar, write that down. Go ahead and eat your meal. Two hours after you eat your meal, check your blood sugar again. It should be within about 40 points of that pre-meal blood sugar. If it is, that's how you know your insulin's working for you. Short-acting insulin, this is your Humulin R or Novolin R. This insulin also comes in injectable form as well. 
It's administered 30 minutes prior to eating. It controls your blood sugar for roughly three to six hours. Again, just like the rapid acting insulin, please don't forget to eat. You don't wanna just administer your insulin, think you have 30 minutes, but oh wait, the phone rings. Take a phone call, speak with your sister for an hour, and then start feeling hypoglycemic because again, that insulin is already starting to work on you. So again, don't forget to eat with this one as well. Intermediate insulin, this is your Novolin N or your Humulin N, also known as NPH. It starts to work two to four hours after injection. It controls blood sugar for 12 to 18 hours. This insulin looks different from your other ones because again, this insulin is gonna be your cloudy insulin. Also, something to keep in mind with this insulin is the name, Novolin N, Humulin N. It's very similar in name to your short-acting insulin, which is Humulin R, Novolin R. So a lot of people, they are on two different types of insulin, some type of intermediate and a short-acting. You wanna make sure that you're administering the right insulin because you know the only difference, if you're not looking at the vial and you're just looking at the name, is a letter. So just be careful when you're administering your insulin. Okay, finally, the long-acting insulin. This is your Levamir, your Lantus. This also comes in vials and injectable pen form. It starts to work several hours after injection. It controls your blood glucose for roughly 24 hours, and it's to be administered at the same time every day. The administration time on this one is very important. For example, say Monday night, you give yourself, you know, you check your blood sugar, you give yourself your insulin at 9 p.m. On technically, you know, the way this insulin is supposed to work, by 9 p.m. on Tuesday, you should still have some blood sugar coverage. But say, you know, 9 o'clock is not convenient for you, you're a night owl, you want to give it to yourself later in the night, so you decide you want to start administering it at 10 p.m. So again, Monday at 9 p.m., you administered your insulin. Tuesday at 10 p.m., you decided you're gonna start administering the Lantus at that point in time. There is gonna be that hour worth of time between nine and 10 where you're not really gonna be covered with any insulin. You're not necessarily gonna get you know, a big spike in blood sugar, but you know, just something to keep in mind. Same thing if you wanna change it to an earlier time. Say instead of uh, nine o'clock, you wanna give it at eight o'clock. So again, Monday night at nine o'clock, you give yourself insulin. Tuesday night at 8 p.m. you want to give yourself insulin, there is going to be that hour between 8 and 9 where you have a little bit of extra coverage. But again, this does not mean you're necessarily going to go hypoglycemic. It's just you may see a little bit of fluctuations in your numbers. Now we're going to talk about premixed insulin. There's a lot of different premixed insulins out there. Your Humulin 7030, your Novolin 7030, Novolog 7030, Humulin 5050, Humalog 7525, and Humalog 5050. So that's a lot to take in. The numbers that you see there are the amount of insulin, the amount of intermediate insulin mixed with short acting insulin or your rapid acting insulin. Because of, there's a whole bunch of different types up there, it starts to work anywhere from between five and 60 minutes and it can last anywhere for, from 10 to 16 hours. These insulins are really convenient for some people. They're helpful for those who have trouble drawing up insulin from two different bottles, have poor eyesight or poor dexterity. But again, these types of insulins, they're not necessarily for everybody, so don't be discouraged if you're not taking a premixed insulin, if you still have you know, your two vials at home. Final slide I have for you is an insulin graph. This just shows you how all the different insulins compare. The red line, that's your Humalog, Novolog, and Epidra, or your rapid acting insulins. You can see how um, this insulin does peak roughly about an hour. What that means is when your insulin has the strongest effect on your blood sugar is about at that hour mark. The next one, your regular insulin, the Humulin R or Novolin R. This is your short-acting insulin. Again, this one peaks in roughly two to three hours, and that's your green line there. The NPH, the Humulin N or Novolin N. This is the blue line. This is your intermediate insulin. 
you can see that this one definitely lasts a lot longer and it peaks roughly in about eight hours. Finally, we have the Lantis or the Levomir, that's your yellow line. As you can see, this line does not have a peak because this medication doesn't peak. It's supposed to control your blood sugar for 24 hours. There is not one moment throughout the day where you should be getting more coverage than another hour. So again, to, you know, to recap, insulin doesn't mean you know, it has to be forever. It can be very temporary. The goal is to get your blood sugar within a target range to prevent any complications from your diabetes. Some points to remember, remember to check your blood sugar before you administer your insulin. You don't want to be hypoglycemic, not know it, and give yourself an injection of insulin and cause some type of hypoglycemic crisis. The insulins, again, you know, you're your short acting and your, your intermediate insulins, they have very similar names. You wanna make sure that you're administering the right medication, especially if you're on both of these. The long acting insulin, again, lasts 24 hours. You wanna to try to administer that insulin at the same time every day. The premix insulin, it works for some, it is very convenient. So if you are taking two different insulins, whether it be short acting and an intermediate or a regular, sorry, a rapid acting or an intermediate, maybe talk to your physician to see if maybe one of, you know, the premix insulins are, it could be beneficial to you. I hope my presentation has kind of clarified any misconceptions. I hope I answered your questions about insulin. Thank you.